Hey everybody, welcome to this week's podcast. No special announcements or anything this week, so I'm going to just jump right into it. First up, pre-orders are now open for an officially licensed re-release of the NES game Battletoads and Double Dragon. They're open now from May 22nd, and the price is $60 plus shipping, which seems to be cheaper than just cartridge only is going for on the original one. Plus, it's got a cool, transparent green cartridge, uh, and, you know, it's a complete in box full re-release. So overall, it seems to be a pretty good deal for people that are looking to use original cartridges or collectors that want something unique and different. I have the link right here. If you're listening audio only, it's retrorgb.link forward slash battletoad dd. And uh, there's more info to talk about, though, and a few other things that I'd like to discuss. First of all, and probably the most important, while I have not seen this one with my own eyes, all of the previous re-releases that Retrobit has done in the past at least few years have been properly made. So the edges are chamfered and beveled, they're made properly with the right components and the right voltage. So while I, of course, can't say for sure until I get it, it seems like these are going to be completely safe to use in all original consoles and probably even clone consoles as well. And I would feel completely comfortable ordering this one. Obviously, double check it when it arrives just to be sure, but they have a pretty good history of doing this, and I can't imagine Ron would switch gears for the NES game releases versus the Genesis ones. So hopefully they have good consultants working on that one as well. The only other things I wanted to really mention is something that I don't quite understand. So I think um, I think I would love to hear all of your opinions on this, but the box that it comes in looks very cool, and it even opens almost like a book. But is it the same size and shape as an original NES box, and does anybody care? So while I do collect things, I wouldn't refer to myself as a collector. And one of the things that's important to me, which maybe nobody else on the planet gives a shit about, but one of the things that's important to me is that if I buy a re-release like this, I really want it to sit on my shelf next to the originals and have it fit in. So if this box is the same size and shape as the original NES boxes, I could sit it next to my original, I think I have RC Pro-Am complete in box here, and it would be neat. It would look cool on my shelf. And if not, it still would look cool. The cartridge is transparent green and looks neat. It comes with a cartridge display stand that I'm sure I could put that in my shelf if I really wanted to display it. So I, this is not a negative point. This is really just a neutral point. And I would love to hear everybody else's opinions on this. Is this important to you collectors or am I the only person who even thinks about stuff like this? So I'm just kind of wondering if that's the case. And for all I know, the, the box is the exact same size and shape. Uh, maybe next time Retrobit could just kind of do that for comparison, put it next to the original just so you could see or, or even just put like dimensions so that you can see the size of it. But honestly, the only other thing to say is that Retrobit's re-releases, at least the ones in the past few years, I don't remember what they did before this, have all been good and fair. And I mention that because, you know, life isn't all positive. There is some negatives out there and there are some companies that make their living on dumb cash grabs with poorly made games that are not safe to use in your consoles and they're more expensive than the original sell for on eBay. And this is not the case. So I, if I ever have a choice, I would rather not mention anything negative at all, but I can't give Retrobit enough praise for this without mentioning that because I have to say that Retrobit so far has not gone for the cash grab. They haven't done a, a re-release of Mario Brothers Duck Hunt, called it rare and limited and sell it for 200 bucks. All the stuff they've been releasing uh, it's either a good value or it adds something to it, like the Wily Wars. You know, you couldn't get an NTSC version of it officially. There's a bunch of good stuff they've been doing. So I only wanted to mention the negative just to further praise Retrobit. That this is obviously not a cash grab because it's cheaper than what they're going for on eBay used. So I had to make it, uh, take a moment to do that. This week's podcast is once again brought to you by JLC PCB, and I'm going to once again show you how to place a PCB plus assembly order and kind of skip through what I talked about before, as well as apply what I learned in the mistake that I made last time. So the process is pretty much the same. You upload your Gerber file and then scroll down and add SMT assembly to your order. 
then just kind of add that to your cart and it's going to ask you for the bill of materials file as well as the CPL pick and place file. The pick and place is something that is created by whatever software that you use in order to create these files and the bill of materials is a pane that I showed before that I'll talk more about later. The other new step is JLCPCB is asking you to categorize it. And since, as usual, the stuff that I make doesn't fit into a category, I'm just going to go into electronics, other, and SCART cleaner. And here is the spot that I want to talk about, both to show you how to use JLCPCB, but also to help with any projects you might be working on now. So this is the list of the materials. And here at the bottom, where you see no part selected, that's what you're going to have to deal with. And there are two scenarios here to talk about. The first is the SCART connector. And this is something you're always going to have to deal with because no major company st st would stock SCART connectors anymore. That's just not something that people outside of gaming use. So I would leave this blank and manually add them. I'm sure JLCPCB would work with you on very large orders, but for small stuff, expect some hand assembly. However, here is one that you would have expected to work, the THS7374 video amp. And as you can see, it says inventory shortage, which is obviously a result of the global part shortage. And that's the other thing I really wanted to talk to you about in this ad. And that's something that I really need to take a moment to talk about. And while this is still a JLC PCB ad, I think this is important advice that anybody working on an assembly order right now should listen to. When you get to that screen where you see all of the components there, when you see a lot missing, because we're in a part shortage and there's going to be a lot missing, you should go through like I did and try to find exact replacements. And sometimes you'll get very easy solutions. Best example, there was one capacitor that they didn't have the exact one in stock, but they had the same size, shape, and capacitance with a higher voltage tolerance. That's fine, as long as it meets the minimum voltage tolerance, you can go as high as you want. So not only did I replace it there, I also replaced it in the bill of materials so that, as you could see in this previous video, everything populated. So you don't have to worry about that in the future. But there was another issue that we ran into, which is the advice that I want to give. There were so many little parts, and in this example, it would be the USB power port, the audio jack, and the VGA connector that they had other alternatives that weren't the exact same size and shape, but they were the same specs. They were not They were very close, they just wouldn't fit on the same pads. So in that case, originally, I just tried ordering some of those own parts myself. And I showed that in the previous ad, so if you want, you could uh, have parts ordered and sent to them so that they could assemble it. You could do hand assemble it yourself. Since we're gonna add the SCART connectors anyway, I didn't think that was a problem, but the part wasn't right. And I think an important thing that people should hear now in the part shortage is when you go through and you see parts missing, take a look at what they have and consider modifying your design for it. And once again, I'm not saying change the whole design, but things like the USB port and the audio connector, they were just very, very small changes inside the software. There weren't new traces rerun. There wasn't a major revision. It was just tiny little things that made it so much easier. So now I just dropped the bill of materials in and got what you saw just now. And not only that, but the parts were even cheaper. So if we weren't in a global part shortage, I might have different advice. But now I really think that especially if you're the one designing the board, taking a moment to slowly adapt that to equal parts in quality, but maybe slightly different shape that's in stock is incredibly important. And we've heard stories from everybody in retro gaming who's had to do the same thing. But this was one of the first times I got to really demonstrate it. So I'm happy I was able to do so and hopefully made this a little bit more informative and fun than just a standard standard ad, because it's what I always try to do with these, make them a little bit more fun and a little bit more advice that you could actually take. And I never read out of a script or anything, which is probably obvious considering how many times I fumble my words in these. But anyway, thank you to JLC PCB for sponsoring these. I will finish up another round of videos about this PCB assembly order. But if we did everything right, the follow-up video for this one should simply be me unboxing, adding a SCART connector, soldering it on, and having a final test of it. So cross your fingers that I didn't mess anything up this time, and please check out the link to JLCPCB if you want your own assembly orders made. 
Next up is a post about the Sega Saturn link cable, which is designed to link two Saturns together by plugging them into each other the same way you would link two Game Gears, two Game Boys, and even the Dreamcast. I did that live stream with Destiny a few years ago where we connected two Dreamcasts and tried out all the games that were supported with it. And as usual, the Sega Saturn Shiro crew absolutely put together an amazing piece about the cable itself and every single game that is compatible with it. And I just had such a good time reading through this and, and kind of seeing what we never got but could, I guess, because obviously you could still figure out how to get the cables or possibly even make your own today. And it was interesting to see some of the games that supported it, including the Japan-only version of uh, Daytona Champion Edition, or Circuit Edition, sorry. I'm, I'm always thinking of the Street Fighter Champion Editions. But anyway, if, if you're into history, video game history like this, or if you're interested in ways that you could use your existing Saturn and try to do something new and unique with it, especially with all these optical drive emulators that allow you to easily play a lot of these games and backups and stuff like that, I, I think this would be a very cool thing to check out. Um, you know, as kids, it wasn't really common to see anybody bring a TV over their friend's house along with their console in order to, to battle against each other. And in fact, as a kid, I think I only remember playing Game Boy linked together once or twice, maybe with friends and never with my Game Gear. So I'm not sure how common it was for anybody else, but it, it's something that I always thought was really neat. And uh, I just really appreciate people that take the time to do such in-depth analysis of, of what was in other places and what we never got and what we could still do. And I'll stop gushing over it. Check out the piece if you'd like. And maybe someday I could do a, a link cable stream with the Saturn as well to try out some of these games as well. Probably the Shiro crew would be better to do that. So hopefully they'll do a live stream soon or something. Next, Chris from Displaced Gamers just released the latest episode of Talking Code, and in this one he goes into Mega Man 2 and a little bit of Mega Man 3, specifically what the code is doing during horizontal collision checks, and also what does it take to draw a frame of video and why do games like Mega Man 3 slow down at times. And as usual, these are more podcasty style with good visual examples, but more podcasty style laid back videos, not the same style as his other ones, but I like them both equally. I like to listen to these. And even though I'm not a programmer and I don't quite always understand what's going on, I do find it a fascinating look into how these games work. And it's really Chris's videos is the first time I've really like grasped how the code generates the game itself. I always kind of knew it was there just because, you know, I've been doing computers and IT my whole life, but this is the first time I was ever able really to visualize it, which is why I like following the talking code and the, all of the other displaced gamers videos. So if you're a nerd like me, even if you're not a programmer, check this one out and see what you think. So this next post was originally just supposed to be, hey, you remember that HDMI splitter with downscaling capabilities I talked about last year? Well, as I always say, this is a tool in your toolbox that you could use for multiple things, and here's another use for it. If you have a newer TV and an older AVR, you could use this to split the signal, send the 1080p one to the older AVR, and now keep your uncompressed audio formats. And really, that was all it was meant to be, except I went down a rabbit hole, I learned a lot about it, I rewrote the post at least once. So if you don't really care about this stuff, please just skip to the next section. I have the timestamps everywhere, audio and video, so it should be easy enough to skip. However, if you do care about audio and basically you use anything other than your TV's built-in speakers, you might want to listen to this one. So the problem that I had was that a good problem to have is that when I first hooked up those Ascend acoustic speakers to that NAD amp, I was so blown away by the sound that when I went upstairs to listen to my 5.1 ELAC based system, I just kind of went, uh, <laughs> I even brought the NAD amp upstairs and even hooked it up to just two of the ELACs and it sounded amazing. So I knew I needed to upgrade my AVR, but I don't have the money to spend on a really good one. So of course I went for used. I ended up getting an Anthem MRX 510, and the problem that I had was that it could only support up to HDMI 1.4. So this is a problem that a lot of people are running into. You're getting used gear, or you had a TV and a receiver from five or six years ago. You go to buy a new TV, you love the receiver, maybe you spent a ton of money like what this one probably was when it was new, and you don't want to upgrade. So what do you do from here? 
Well, there's a few choices, and not any of them are perfect, including the solution that I suggested. The main reason I suggested it, once again, tool in a toolbox, only 30 bucks. You could use it for multiple things. Uh, but I want to go over the rest of them for anybody else that is in this scenario. So the first thing that you could do is get a device that is like an eARC audio extractor. It essentially looks like an HDMI splitter, but output two is audio only. And some of those work great, but they're more expensive than the splitter I just talked about. And a lot don't support CEC control. So if you have one remote, like your streaming box that turns your TV on and off, now you'll always have to grab your TV's remote to do that. Somebody told me a way that you could just connect one pin, you know, you could crack open these things and connect one pin from the input to the output. But that's kind of a hard mod. They're thin pins. You'd have to trace it out. Not everybody would be willing to do that. And especially not everybody would be willing to mod something that could potentially be plugging into thousands of dollars worth of TV and stereo equipment. So if you wanted a really good eARC extractor that does support CEC and that seems to work well with all formats and just passes the video through, there's one out there, but it's going to be at least 60, 70 bucks and you could get clones and knockoffs, but they don't support CEC. There's other firmware issues with that. So then you might think, well, what about Spitif? And that's an excellent solution. And that's one that I used in New York because I had a little tiny apartment that there was no way I was turning up the stereo because I don't want to piss off every neighbor in the building. So in that scenario, Spitif was perfect because while it did compress the audio channels for surround sound stuff, I would have never heard the difference. I, my guess is I would have never heard the difference on the lowest end Denon receiver that I owned. So I wouldn't have heard the difference anyway, but especially not when I'm turning it up. And when the speakers weren't at proper positions, I had the surrounds up on shelves above my head in the corners. I don't think I would have heard that. The good news about that is if you're using compressed audio formats anyway, or 2.0, it's fine. And the easiest thing about it, whenever you want to use it, all you have to do is lower the volume on your TV and turn on the receiver, and that's it with most TVs. The other downside to that is you're relying on your TV to send the proper signal through its audio output, and sometimes with more modern formats, it doesn't work right. There's forums all over the place that have people complaining about that. And as we've all known with TV manufacturers, you can't really expect them to do firmware updates. They should, but they don't. So the other thing you could do is ARC, Audio Return uh, Control Command. I forgot what it was, but Audio Return Channel. I think I got it wrong in the post, but most TVs and receivers have that now. And so often it does not work. Now, most of my experience with this was when it was first released, so I know I'm a little biased, but even on my TV upstairs, I had to make sure that many settings were changed. And then same thing with that Anthem receiver. I had to both enable ARC and CEC. And then I don't really know how reliable the TV would be to pass all formats. Is it like Spitif, or if it's a newer audio format, it would have an issue? I don't really know, but there's some annoyances to it. And also, whenever, at least on my TV, I enable it, I have to grab the TV remote, go into the menu, enable it, then enable CEC control on it. I can't just use like the quick menu. And it works cool after that, but it's kind of a pain and I still don't know if I trust my TV sending the proper signal. The only other advantage is with at least the Anthem receiver, I'm able to connect it to the ARC output of the receiver. So if I need to fire up my TV and check out some of the uh, on-screen menu stuff with the receiver, I'm able to do that. Of course, using that takes up another HDMI input on your TV. So if you have three inputs and three devices, this is going to suck because you're not going to be able to do that. You would need some kind of HDMI external device anyway. So that brings us to the splitter. And as far as I could tell, it did not change the video in any possible way. And I tested that when I originally, uh, when I originally reviewed them. However, I don't have the ability to taste, to test, to taste, geez, to test the latest Dolby Vision formats. Um, and I was told that these might have issues with those. There are some other issues. They don't pass CEC control either. And also they don't support variable refresh rates and they locked at 4K 60. So this is not something you would want to use with a modern console. However, 
If you have a modern console, maybe plug that into another HDMI port on your TV. Just use Spitif for audio, because I don't think any brand new games have like Dolby uh, Atmos audio or something like that. Um, and just use the splitter for your streaming box or something like that. So I wanted to lay out all the options because it's not as simple as just connecting cables anymore. You always have to worry about uh, which HDMI version, if the HDCP will get in the way, your different audio formats that are going through there. It gets really confusing. Like I warned you at the beginning, I went down a rabbit hole with this. And for me personally, I think my best solutions are either going to be this box, the easy coup that allows me to select. I always want output to downscale to 1080p 60. I always want one to be passed through and then do a mod to pass CEC through it. I think that would be the easiest solution. I think that's the, you know, the least pain, but this might not be for you. It, uh, you know, you, any of the other solutions might work better for you. I just wanted to put this out there because like I said at the beginning, there's way more people out there who are upgrading their TV who don't need to upgrade their AVR because it's already awesome for audio. Or you could be like me and you're just cheap and don't have the money to spend on a brand new fancy receiver. So uh, I was able to pick this up for cheaper than most brand new decent receivers and it performs way better than that base model Denon I had. So just wanted to share my experience with this mini review. Hopefully I could help point people in the right direction. And if not, hey, at least now you know not what to do for your setup. <laughs> Mark for My Life in Gaming just posted a very detailed review of both the LG C2 and C1 OLED panels. The C2 is the 2022 edition, C1 is obviously the 2021, and the, the whole thing was an interesting ride. It was a long video, it's about an hour long, but the whole first part was basically figuring out everything that's wrong with the launch edition firmware of the C2. And as with previous LG TVs, there's no telling if they're going to fix it or if their firmware update will make it worse, like with my C6, the 2016. With every firmware update, the lag got more and the compatibility went down. So I, I don't really like doing firmware updates unless I have to. But it was very, um, if anybody wants to know what it's like to test products doing the retro RGB stuff, listen to Mark's frustration and listen to his rant, which I, tears were rolling down my face during his rant, both because it was funny and because I have felt that way so many times working on these projects where you get halfway through and you're testing so many things and you realize it's broken at its core and then you try to fix it. And yeah, it's a great video and it's a really great look into what it's like to test and review products. Um, the most frustrating thing though, is most of the people that I work with, I get to provide feedback. Most listen, some don't, which is a little maddening because that's a total waste of time. But Mark was in a scenario where LG hasn't listened to any of us ever, so, which is very frustrating because there's so many people out there that could just help point out things that they probably didn't know about. But the video has a good ending. The C1, last year's model, does perform exactly the way Mark expected. It's an excellent TV, and probably by the time you're listening to this, but not for much longer, you could still get them at a heavy discount versus the launch date price. Now, these are not cheap TVs. And I also want to just take a quick moment to remind everybody that if you're looking for a fast TV that's not laggy, that could be compatible with all your retro games, you could get them for 300 bucks or less. The TV that I always show in my videos, I think that was 299 or something like that when I got it new. You don't need to spend a lot of money, but it is my strong opinion that if you are going to spend a lot of money, spend it where it matters. So if you're looking at a $1,600 TV and a $1,900 TV, and one of them is this OLED and the other one is something else, I would absolutely save your money and get the right one for you. And for me personally, OLED is perfect in absolutely every scenario except a PC monitor where you're going to leave it on all day and you don't want the bottom to burn in. Or for like, to be honest, like a bedroom TV. I use my bedroom TV more as a nightlight for what, for what I'm getting, getting ready that I do to actually watch it, which is why I spent so little money on it. But you know, that's just trying to put things into perspective. Um, definitely check out the video. Mark did a great job going through everything and really one thing that you should definitely take away from it is these OLED panels 
are not at all an exaggeration. We really do all like them this much. Um, and there's no affiliate link in my post, so you can't, you know, or Mark's post, so you can't say that that's just why we're doing it. Um, this really is a TV that we'd like a lot. And I certainly wish that I could pick one up at the moment. I'm not going to lie. I had the 77 inch in like in my cart staring at it. And I'm like, you don't need this. You'll be perfectly good OLED TV. So yeah, I didn't, I didn't pull the trigger, but uh, definitely check out the video if you're interested in this stuff. Tino from Macho Nacho Productions just posted a video on a no-cut RGB and S-Video mod for the Pioneer Laser Active. So a very quick rundown, the Laser Active is a laser disc player that also has modules that allows you to play Turbo Graphics games or Genesis games, as well as Sega CD games. And it is an expensive and very awesome and rare piece of equipment. They're also known for having their capacitors go bad, and there's a million of them, so it's kind of a nightmare to maintain, but once you do it, you should be good for quite a long time afterwards. However, they only output composite video. So this mod that's shown allows you to have RGB output for your Genesis and S-Video output for the Laserdisc. And Tito's video is awesome. I don't want to take anything else away from that, but I do want to add some thoughts based on my experience with, um, with all of this stuff that I think might apply to people who might think about doing this. First and foremost, everybody always says when I talk about S-Video on Laserdisc or VHS tapes, but they were encoded in composite, you know, that you're not going to get anything out of that. And the truth is, it depends. What I think is happening, this is a guess, but it's a guess from quite a lot of experience with this. What I think is happening is on players that natively support S-Video and do a good job with it, they are taking the video right on the motherboard, right off as soon as it's getting decoded from the tape putting it through a really good comb filter and separating it to S-Video there. So it's only composite video on the tape and for just a little bit on the motherboard. And then Y and C, the colors, and then all of the sync and brightness information are separated. And that, I think, is how, as long as you use shielded cables, you could get better performance out of that because you're basically taking the best part of the composite video signal and not messing it up anymore by putting it down a long cable, smushing all the information together. What this mod does is kind of similar. However, you would need a few things on the S-Video line. You would need to make sure the cable is shielded. You need to make sure you're tapping it from the closest places. And it might not even be an upgrade in this scenario if there's no filtering on there. However, if you have a setup where you're, you're routing a bunch of S-Video stuff, that might make your life a lot easier. The only downside is the S-Video is only for the Laserdisc player. They didn't mux in any of the S-Video lines off of the CXA chip for Genesis, which might have been something that could have been appealing to you. Like, what if you're hooking this up to a TV that has composite and S-Video inputs, but no RGB or component? You could have used S-Video for both, but, you know, just... Uh, uh, just something to note. I don't think it's that big a deal. And then the RGB lines are tapped directly from the processing chip, so it should output the same exact way that a Genesis does. Once again, it is a no-cut mod, which is really important because stuff that's so expensive and rare like this, I would never want to cut a hole into. But putting a 3D printed thing on the back of it and running wires through pre-existing holes... Hell yeah, you can put it back to stock should you ever want to anytime you wanted, and you get nice RGB output out of your Genesis. So my uh, my own little extra nerdy thoughts aside, I loved Tito's video, and I really like to see rare pieces of equipment get highlighted like this. So even if you're not into Laserdiscs or Sega CD, I would watch this one. This was fun, and it was very cool to see such a rare piece of equipment highlighted. The wiki is here. I have been talking about this for years. I wanted to launch this on the 300th, but I wanted to do it justice. So I wanted to make sure that I had enough time to talk about it. And now is that time. So a little bit of background, and then I'll tell you what this is today. But basically, a couple of years ago, I wanted to start a wiki where I took all of the facts off of retro RGB, the guides and everything else, and made it open so that anybody could contribute and that we archive this information as best as we can. And that all went to shit for things that were mostly out of my control. And then by the time I swung back around, um, I was so busy just trying to keep retro RGB afloat and keep doing this for a day job that I never had time to go back and make the wiki. I tell the full story in the interview with Durf here, but that brings us to today. I've met a few people over the years that tried to start a wiki and wanted to team up and all of those fell through 
respectfully, I think once people realized how much work it actually is, they kind of disappeared. Uh, but Durf has been around and doing this for a while now. He had his guides up on Reddit, which he then migrated to his own wiki and reached out to me, seeing if I wanted to contribute, not even really knowing the whole backstory. And I've been working with him for a while now. I've been very, respectfully, I've been very slow, somewhat intentionally, mostly because I'm just super busy, but been kind of slow in doing this just to see how this evolves, see how the Discord evolved, and everything has been great so far. People on the Discord have been great to talk to, the wiki's coming together, and this is something that I think we're all going to benefit from. Now, I did a, a podcast that's mostly audio only, but we show um, examples in there too of the wiki itself, so if you want to hear the full story of what the wiki's all about, what we're trying to accomplish, how you can help now, please listen to that. And, you know, even if you think you might only help maybe, maybe give us your time and listen, you know, do it while you're exercising or, you know, commuting or whatever else and see what you think. I'll summarize it here just, and I don't want to go too long in respect to people's time, but basically the goal is to have a single, just the facts repository of anything related to video games, retro PCs, um, CRTs, anything, anything that won't, that won't be released on Wikipedia bring it here. And in fact, you know, anything that even might be on Wikipedia, double it here too, because there were some issues with things getting removed over the years that are facts. And we talked about that. It might have been legit. It might not have. I don't really care. The bottom line is that things were removed from Wikipedia that we rely on as retro gamers that are not opinions, that are just facts. So uh, we all want to keep on holding on to this stuff. And as much as I try not to use the word preservation as too much, because a lot of people really abuse that word, this is the absolute definition of that. We want to preserve all of the info, but also present it for anybody to use. So the goal of this, right now we have, there's a few consoles up, and I we have just started migrating the pages from Retro RGB. That's another thing we talk about at the end of the interview, but basically anything that's a guide, I want to take off of Retro RGB, put it on there, eventually have all the pictures updated with better ones, and then take every page on Retro RGB that was a guide and redirect it to the wiki or uh, add just a little blurb about what was there with a link to the wiki. But basically the final idea of Retro RGB being about opinions, a community focused site where anybody could contribute articles. All you have to do is just have passion for this stuff and the ability to write an article. And then, ha but all of those are your opinions. And while we're nerds and most of our opinions are going to be filled with the facts that we use to have those, the wiki is going to be the opposite. These are the facts. These are the spec sheets. These are the guides. These are the... So I hope that these two could live together and kind of complement each other. And I'm going to be standing by this one. This is the wiki. It's called consolemods.org. I probably should have opened with that, to be honest. Um, but whatever we, whatever it's called in the future, it'll probably stay at the same name, but doesn't really matter what it's called. It doesn't really matter where it's hosted. This is the thing that I've been talking about for years. Durf and I share the same vision about this. So I think this is going to be awesome. And all we need now is for people just to step up and help, which I think will be easier than you'd think because there's a lot of people out there with great info that posted it on a forum somewhere that's kind of lost. All I, you know, all you got to do is copy and paste that reformat it to the wiki, and there you go. All of your hard work is now archived. All the people who post all of their work up on social media, which still do, that's awesome. We all enjoy seeing that. If it's a new thing, if it's install points, if it's something important, put those pictures up on the wiki. And maybe if, uh, if you have people following you on social media that are good writers, maybe they'll help. Here's my pictures. Here's what I did. Maybe you can go write the article. So Whatever it is that you end up doing, this is about all of us. And I want to try to keep this info out there so that we don't have to worry about forums going down, not being able to find it. What do you do? I think this is going to be a start of something pretty awesome. So please listen to the podcast if you want all of the info, but hopefully I just summed it up in five-ish minutes here if you just kind of want the overview. But it's exciting. And I'm going to end, I'm going to end with this. For years now, I have been teasing Nick from HD Retrovision about which one of our delayed projects is going to release first. And I kind of cheated by teaming up with Durf. However, the wiki is out before the HD Retrovision Dreamcast cables. So now it's up to you, HD Retrovision, 
what's coming first? All of the badass consoles refunds or the Dreamcast component video cables? <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to eat so much shit for saying that. And now it's time for this week's Mr. Updates, Care of Lou from Lou's Retro Source. As usual, I'm going to skim through these, only adding my thoughts where I really need to, but for the most part, I want to just run down everything. And then if you hear anything that piques your interest, please check out Lou's video. Don't forget to subscribe to him. And of course, if you prefer written, you could check out this post here. So let's jump right into it. There's a 32X core on the Mr. There's a 32X core on the Mr. There's a... 32x core on the mister seriously srg 320 in the middle of a freaking war zone came out of nowhere with a 32x core that you just load up on your mister and not only has it been released there's already been some updates that iron out some audio bugs holy crap Anytime anybody asked me my opinion on this, I would have said that SRG320 would have probably finished off the Saturn core, and then when they were done, swung back around to do 32X. But now, for the first time ever, you could play 32X easily on an RGB monitor or even through HDMI on the Mister, and you don't have to worry about all of the crap involved. I'm obviously a Sega fan, and the 32X I have referred to as the mushroom turd for as long as I can remember now, because it never works right. Never. You gotta insert your cartridge a hundred times. You could recap and clean and reflow and do whatever the whatever you want. It's not gonna work right consistently. And if you do get it to boot, sometimes it'll just freeze. And it could be on a stock 32X, on a stock Genesis, on triple bypass modded, whatever. It is truly the mushroom turd. And now, unless you want the original experience, which I still do, I still have my, my CDX with the, the laser bear adapter and the 32X on it. I will probably bring this to my grave just because I love having the original experience sometimes. For the most part, I am never touching a 32X cartridge again, even though I'm still keeping the ones that I own. I just, I am so appreciative that we get to have this. This is one of those things where it's like, yeah, I have the original consoles and I have a mister. It's a great project. This is such a convenience for everybody who likes 32X games. In case you haven't figured it out, it's a real big deal. And it was all done by SRG320. So listen, please consider supporting them on Patreon to the point where if you have a choice between supporting me and supporting them, support them. I'll, I'll figure something out. They're in the middle of a war zone, still bringing you the ability to play 32X without all the bullshit of the actual mushroom. I'm, I'm blown away. That's all I got to say. Thank you so much for your contributions, for all of the things that you've added to Mr. Uh, and, you know, th this one just kind of hit everybody with shock and just with amazement that this could happen. So that was amazing. But let me continue on with Lou's post. Also, Furtech had mentioned that he's still continuing work on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles core. Other parts have been implemented, but now they got to go through bug hunting for all that, which is frustrating and probably the most boring part, but it's what makes these cores so accurate. So thank you to Furtech for always continuing to dive deep into all of that. Uh, Darren O is also working on some arcade cores. And a few of them have reached beta status, and there's also a few that are not yet available for download, but a Track 17 was helping work on these. So the more arcade cores that we can get out there, the better. I'm a huge fan of MAME. I've always loved MAME, but having everything on the Mister, but not worrying about latency is going to be something that we all appreciate. And while I'll never stop using MAME, I would love to have everything all in one box. Um, also, Track17 did a big public Patreon post regarding a bunch of Mr. FPGA stuff, um, and also with some of the PCBs that have been purchased and sent to developers to try and make cores for. I don't want to list the games respectfully just because I don't want to put pressure on any developer. I try to never do that, but um, that's all I got to say is that it's very exciting that we might be getting some of these cores to the Mr. It's, it's pretty awesome. Um, also, the PlayStation Core has some more bug fixes. Uh, there's no more graphical glitches in the widescreen hack. Um, you could use your own audio CD images, which is kind of neat, kind of a neat thing. And basically, it's just getting to feel more like you're using a PlayStation uh, with extra features. So it's very impressive that it's come this far. And, uh, you know, it's certainly stable enough that if you wanted to mess around with it, 
now is definitely the time. It's not official public release, but if you're using update all, you could just enable the beta cores and stuff like that. I think there might be a Patreon option, but I, I subscribe to everybody there on Patreon. So my apologies if I got that wrong. Also, Hotego did a bunch of bug fixes for existing cores to, uh, to improve on hardware accuracy. And there was even a hardware flaw in the original Ghost and Goblins PCB that the hardware developers took advantage of, advantage of to get a flashing effect. So I remember reading that post from, and I think I read it twice because I kind of just skimmed through and then went, oh, that's really neat. So now there's an option that I think you could enable that or not. But I think these bug fixes, while they're not as exciting as talking about a new core, really are equally as important because going back and learning this stuff is not only going to help everybody, including Hotego for other cores they do, but it's really a great way to document how these things work. And it just, it's really digging deeper into how all of this stuff comes together. It's also more progress on the next one, next 186 core. Uh, and the next um, Mr. FPGA stage event is now available to listen to. This has uh, core developers Wicker Waka and Birdie Bro. I haven't gotten a chance to listen to the last two, I think, but I really enjoy those. I think if you like the Mr. Project and you just like listening to nerds talk about their projects, obviously I mean that with love, but that's definitely a podcast you might want to consider subscribing to. So as always, thanks very much to Lou for doing all of these. It's really awesome that I get to, that we all get to just kind of listen and get these updates without, you know, hunting them down in a million other places. And by the way, in case you didn't realize it, there's a 32X core on the Mr. <laughs> Developer Hilltop has just released an English translation for the PlayStation side-scrolling shooter Harmful Park, and this game is kind of akin to Keo Flying Squadron and other similar games like that. And while the opening FMVs are still in Japanese, Hilltop kind of went an interesting route in order to do a lot of the translation. So they used a tool which they created to extract and edit sprites and tiles from the game in order to change some of them to English. So you can see in Ronnie's post, there's, you know, the HUD is translated, which you would expect for an English translation, but also all of the subtitles for the FMVs are translated. Both things are, are pretty important and very impressive, but also even things like signs in the background of the game were able to be translated to English as well, which is just a really nice touch. So as I always say, and I don't care if I sound like a broken record, I appreciate anybody that takes the time to translate games from a different language into another one, because I love seeing the world become a smaller place, as cheesy as that is. And I love seeing people being able to experience things that they would never be able to without doing that. But I also extra appreciate when people do things like Hilltop did and, and just get those extra little details. So if you were looking for a new side-scrolling shooter and you don't speak Japanese, now you could add this one to your list. If you want more details about the patch and about Hilltop's other work, please check out Ronnie's post. But this was a cool one. I'm going to have to add this to my list to try and maybe I'll try it on the PlayStation Mr. Core. I don't think there's going to be a Whatnot stream this week, but I wanted to ask all of you what would you like to see me doing on that platform? Or are you sick of hearing about it? You never liked it anyway, and you want, don't want me to talk about it anymore. That's fine too, but I would like to hear that feedback from you in order to, to know that. So the reason I'm asking is because last week, I think was a great example of what I would like to do in that I introduce a bunch of awesome creators in retro gaming to the whatnot crowd. And last week, I think I did a bad job picking the time to do it because there was a lot of competition and a lot less of a chance of people just popping in to see what we were up to. So I'll get better at that. Any suggestions or insight you all have, I'll listen as well. But is there anything else you'd like me to see? I've had a few people ask that maybe I go down to a video game store where I know the owner and do a stream there to try to auction off some of the rare stuff, these smaller stores that might be don't have an online presence have. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to see? I, I just want to make sure that I'm doing the stuff that you all want to see because without you, it's not any fun. And I'll tell you, every one of these whatnot streams has been fun because if they weren't, I wouldn't do it. It's just, I don't have the time to waste on stuff that isn't productive and enjoyable. So it's so far so good, but I want to try to get more ideas. Or once again, if you 
want to hear me stop talking about it, that's fine. The only other things I have planned in the future are bringing more people on like that. And the typical thing that I talked about where I do a video where I have to buy a whole bunch of stuff to do the video and that I just don't need. So I'll, I'll auction that all off when I'm done. But so far, those are my only plans. And I'll probably end up doing one or two streams a month with that unless you all have better ideas or things that you want me to or want to see me do. And uh, don't be shy about tagging whatnot on social media if you want to ask me these things as well, because it's important for them to know that we care or not, because if they don't know it, you know, why would they pay attention to us when I am one of the weirdest people on there? I don't, I don't fit in at all. And I, it, I'm so, I'm so used to being that person. I kind of just enjoy it at this point. So, you know, I, I think it's important to know what do you want to see me do? And if enough people want to want to see this stuff, let whatnot know so that we could all do it together and we can get a little more exposure for this stuff. But I'll stop rambling about it. That's it for this week. As always, thanks so much to everybody who watches, listens, plays nicely in the comments. And thank you to everybody who supports in any way possible, because it's your support that's keeping the podcast all of the insane behind the scenes research, the videos and everything else I'm a part of alive. So thank you all so much and I'll see you next week.